Hello and welcome to People and Profit, where we look at how business shapes our world. I'm Marcus Carlson. Coming up, crude politics. We look at the fallout on international energy markets as Saudi Arabia replaces its veteran oil minister. Shale shock. Europe's energy map may be about to be redrawn as the United States ramps up natural gas exports. Plus, soccernomics. Will Euro 2016 bring an economic boost to the French economy? First, though, to a changing of the guards in the world's biggest crude producer. Saudi Arabia's veteran oil minister Ali Al Naimi, who you can see here on the left, has been replaced by the man on the right, Khalid Al Fali. The latter is the chairman of the state owned oil company Aramco. Saudi Arabia and other oil producers are grappling with low crude prices, and the kingdom has been resisting pressure from other members of OPEC to freeze or reduce output. Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman also wants to make the Saudi economy less dependent on crude exports. And the question is whether the new minister signals a change of policy. Let's get more now on this change in Saudi Arabia with Richard Mallinson. He's an analyst at Energy Aspects in London and he specializes in international affairs and energy policy. Thank you very much indeed, Richard, for being with us here on People and Profit again. I want to start by asking you about Ali Al Naimi. Then he was in the job for more than two decades. Are you surprised to see him go? Not particularly. We've been hearing for some time that he was ready to stand down when the Saudi leadership um, agreed it was time. You know, possibly 12, 18 months. Um, so I think this isn't totally unexpected. As you mentioned, he was in that post for several decades. He's about 80. So this is, I think, not a total surprise that he's now stepped down. Uh, how does Khalid Al Fali stack up against the veteran Al Naimi? Who is he, and and do you think that he will change uh, Saudi oil policies? Well, Khalid Al Fali is another very experienced veteran of the Saudi oil industry. He ran Saudi Aramco for a number of years as chief executive, and then he remained on as chairman when he was appointed as a health minister. So he's already got that experience at the ministerial level in the kingdom when, for about a year. So he's got a lot of experience. He's performed well running Saudi Aramco. He's well regarded both, I think, within Saudi Arabia and internationally. And I think he won't have too much difficulty stepping into this role. Although I would just highlight this is not the same job that Ali Al Naimi was doing. It's a much larger ministry. It's absorbed the electricity portfolio, several other areas of industry, and there are big, ambitious agendas of reform. If we look specifically at oil, Saudi Arabia has been resisting pressure from, from other OPEC members to, to freeze or, or to reduce oil output. Do you think that that policy in particular will, will, will remain? Because that question has really been in the spotlight in international energy markets, uh, hasn't it? Absolutely. It's a really important question. I think on this front, the change in minister is not going to signal a change in policy. We've seen for some years now Saudi Arabia saying to the market that it's not willing to act unilaterally to either cut its production, um, to rebalance the market or in any other way. It's willing to act if other OPEC and non-OPEC members were to take part. That was what they tried to do with the talks in Doha last month, but they failed to reach an agreement. I think we're going to see the same attitude from uh, Saudi Arabia with Khalid al Fala in post. I think, if anything, we may see an even harder line. So for all markets, uh, the new man of the job, he basically means uh, steady she goes, essentially. I think that's the case. However, we've seen a lot of speculation, particularly since those Doha talks broke down. And it's less about who's the oil minister. It's much more about what's the thinking of de the deputy crown prince. He's increasingly seen as the absolutely critical figure in a lot of what's going on in Saudi um, decision making. He's the driving force between, behind this reform agenda. And there is certainly uncertainty about what he might do to oil policy in the future. I think for now, we aren't picking up signs that he's going to make any radical changes. But on, in other areas, everything from foreign policy to subsidy reform, we have seen quite big moves, quite ambitious, bold steps. And so there's an element of uncertainty about Saudi decisions in the future that really wasn't there a year or two ago. And I think that's going to continue to be in focus for the market. I want to finish up by asking you about next uh, month's OPEC meeting. OPEC ministers will essentially meet on, on June uh, the 2nd to potentially talk about the freeze again. Um, do you think that anything could come out of that? 
I mean, I think the June meeting is going to be a non-event. Certainly we'll get the usual headlines and little media circus, but after the failure of the talks in Doha and the very um, dis dissatisfying outcome of the December OPEC meeting back in Vienna, um, I think there's very little optimism amongst the key OPEC members that they can do any sort of deal. I think there's going to be relatively little effort really expended by the Saudis, by the other um, main parties, and so we're not going to get anything of substance coming out of Vienna next month. All right, uh, Richard Mallinson at uh, Energy Aspects. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for speaking to us. Thank you. We're going to stick to the energy theme. Fracking was banned in France five years ago, and there's no change to that policy on the horizon. Critics say there are too many risks associated with drilling for gas using chemicals and water under high pressure. But despite the French ban, shale gas from the United States is about to reach the French market. Solange Mougin explains. It heats our homes and our meals. Gas. For now, most of Europe and France's gas comes from Russia and Norway. But that's changing. Following Portugal's lead, France is slated to receive its first shipment this summer of imported U.S. gas, which was extracted using hydraulic fracturing or fracking, methods that were outlawed in France in 2011. But importing is the prerogative of energy companies, a paradoxical approach that worries France's environment minister. We cannot outlaw fracking in France because of the grave environmental repercussions and then import it. We have other ways of producing energy, so we have to see who signed these deals. France's gas giant signed contracts two years ago with companies in the U.S., the world's number one shale gas supplier. 50 cargo ships worth for EDF. And NG also has shipments of millions of tons of gas slated to arrive on France's shores. The deals are part of a move to keep costs down by buying cheaper U.S. gas and increasing competition. 98% of the gas consumed in France is imported. The more providers there are, the more competition, which will bring prices down. What's certain for consumers is that if there's less competition, their bills will go up. Even if imported shale gas could keep costs down for consumers, the environmental impact of extracting it remains controversial in France, with protesters still coming out to say the environmental damage just isn't worth it. Now, U.S. shale gas could redraw the map of not only the French energy market, but all of Europe's. Kate Moody is here now for more on that. Kate. Well, Marcus, the European Union is almost entirely dependent on imported energy. Most comes from nuclear or renewable energy sources. Just under 17 percent is natural gas. As recently as three years ago, more than two-thirds of gas used in the EU came from Russia and Norway, with Algeria and the Middle East making up the rest. Liquefied natural gas, or LNG, is a relatively new source of energy in Europe. That's gas that's been broken down into liquid form for easier shipping, then regasified once it reaches its destination. With the rise of hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, the U.S. has only recently emerged as a major exporter, beginning to sell LNG abroad in February. The first shipments went to Brazil, then several Asian countries and Portugal. U.S. officials expect America to export more natural gas than it imports by mid-2017, forecasting a steadily growing business for the next 15 years. Because of the processing, LNG can be more costly than natural gas, but Russian gas is currently more expensive than American LNG, sold for an average $5.80 compared to $4.30 per million British thermal units. That could spark a price war if Russia decides to be more competitive and slash its own fees. Now, some analysts say the U.S. is pursuing a geopolitical strategy designed to challenge Russia's domination of energy supplies. For consumers, the competition and lower prices mean lower heating bills. Last year in France, for example, they were 7 percent lower than in 2014. But that comes at a cost, according to environmental activists, who continue to mount strong opposition to fracking and the gas that it produces. Marcus? All right, thank you very much indeed, uh, Kate. France is uh, gearing up to host the European Football Championship. Euro 2016 is kicking off on the 10th of June. Up to 2.5 million fans are expected in the stands, and the prospect of millions of visitors is seen as a boon for the French economy. Here's a closer look at the figures. 24 teams, 51 matches and millions of fans, the sum of which could generate up to 1.5 billion euros for France, according to a recent study. 
The northern city of Lille is one of the ten host cities, and things are already picking up. Cet événement, uh... This grandiose event is not the first of its kind for the Lille region, which has hosted the Davis Cup and basketball tournaments. Our hotels usually perform well in June during the week, but here, in addition to the weekdays when there will be matches, weekends are also looking busy, and there are lots of reservations. The same study found that 20,000 jobs were created for the construction and renovation of stadiums and thousands more around the competition itself, including short-term contracts and volunteer work. But for some, like this company in Lyon behind the Euro's mascot, Super Victor, the major boost is publicity. The benefits are mostly notoriety. We knew that by working for UEFA and especially for the Euro 2016, there was bound to be media coverage, but we didn't think it would be of such magnitude. France is the world's top tourist destination and used to the revenue that generates, but economists warn the added benefits from the Euro could be limited. Numerous studies point to an economic gain. However, when we look at the history of big competitions, especially the Euro and the World Cup, the Olympics are another story. We don't see spectacular economic benefits. Many worry security fears will discourage fans from traveling. But if ticket sales are anything to go by, football remains as big a draw as ever. OK, it's time to wrap up People and Profit this time around. Thank you for watching and get in touch if you have any comments or ideas for the show. You can find us on Facebook at France24Business or you can tweet me at MarcusF24. See you next time.